Good evening and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm your host, Eugene Chan. Our guest tonight is Dr. Paulie Zhang, who is a medical specialist in general surgery and has vast experience on breast cancer treatment in Hong Kong. She graduated from the University of Hong Kong and went on to undertake a surgical fellowship at the University of Michigan in breast and endocrine surgery. She's also fellows of surgical colleges in Glasgow, Australasia, America, and of course here in Hong Kong. She has pioneered the management of breast cancer and also founded the Hong Kong Breast Cancer Foundation, which supports patients and their families. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. We are indeed honored to have you here tonight to share with us the perspectives on breast cancer. Sure. And as we know, um, we hear more and more about breast cancers um, during mm -hmm. our, our normal lives. And I'm sure most of the viewers, including myself, will know someone who has had breast cancer. So is the incidence of breast cancer increasing in Hong Kong? Yes, in fact, breast cancer has been the number one cancer affecting women in Hong Kong since 1994. Right. So over the last quarter of a century, it is still the number one cancer. And at the present time, one in 14 women stand their lifetime risk of breast cancer. Uh, and uh, every day we have 14 people being diagnosed with breast cancer. Right, that's quite a high number, it's isn't true. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that does, does men get affected as well? Oh, sure, yes. 0.5% of the breast cancer cases we see are men. Right. So how does the, this incidence, as you said, is quite high compared to other cancers in, in Hong Kong or, or more specifically to women? Well, in fact, um, breast cancer is the, it, uh, tops the uh, incidence in Asian countries uh, uh, with Hong Kong's incidence. It's 65.5 per 100,000 women being affected by breast cancer. And uh, we know that in women uh, in Hong Kong, uh, when you're talking about colon cancer, uh, the chance is one in 32. So one in 14 for breast cancer is very high. Right, but how does the incidence compare to the mainland, I mean, you just mentioned Asia, yeah. to mainland and, and the uh, Western communities? Well, in the Western communities, the highest incidence is one in eight uh, in America and also in some Western European countries. Uh, in, in China, with the opening up of China, the coastal cities uh, runs a higher uh, risk of breast cancer for the women in living in city. Right. In the rural areas, it's still uh, not uh, as, uh, as, as, as much as those in cities. But we are seeing um, patients uh, uh, increase in numbers in Shanghai, in Beijing, and also in Guangzhou. Right. When you mention different cities, I'm sure the viewers are going to ask you, uh, is it because the city where they live in or, or because of the ethnic background? I think it's the lifestyle because we know that um, Chinese women who move to America the second generation, the incidence of breast cancer is the same as Caucasian. So it must oh, be something in our living st uh, lifestyle or our dietary changes that uh, cause the difference. And also in China, it's very different. In city people, they run a higher risk than the rural people. Mm -hmm. So there must be something in our city life that caused the problem. So from what you're saying, is that Hong Kong, we have like 14 cases diagnosed a day. Yeah. That means Hong Kong as a city, Right. We have, I'm sure we have some high risk factors associated. It's true. So I'm sure the viewers are going to ask you, what causes breast cancers? Well, uh, in fact, uh, from our research, we found that uh, uh, breast cancer patients, over 75% of the breast cancer patients do not have enough exercise per week. Um, the standard is for at least three hours per week right. uh, as, a, as a routine. Uh, now we are seeing more and more people moving into uh, jogging or racing, uh, or yoga, to walk yes, and, yeah. and a lot of more exercise uh, oriented. But still 50% of the people in Hong Kong as a normal population do not have enough exercise as what is quoted as a standard. Right, so, so maybe with COVID when people um, spend more time walking, uh, to, 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 the, to the mountain trails, all that's going to help, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Yes. yes. Um, I'm going to ask you some common myths about breast cancers. Mm. Um, is it something that we eat? Um, say papaya, I mean, if you have papaya... Then you <laughs> papaya have, is good. In is, fact, it contains vitamin A. It's right. rich in vitamin A, which is an anti-cancer right. uh, chemical. Right. Yeah. So there's no specific food that you can identify that as... Oh, called. yes, certainly. Uh, we, uh, there's dietitians uh, who has run studies that shows that the content of animal fat in our diet is a culprit also for uh, breast cancer. Right. So for westernized diet compared to uh, the traditional Chinese diet, it is one quarter of the fatty content uh, in Chinese diet compared to Western right. diet. But you know in Hong Kong, it's a cosmopolitan city yes. and we always follow uh, a lot of things uh, which is uh, handy food. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. we are eating a lot more fatty food than mm -hmm. we use mm -hmm. or our ancestors used to have. 
Right. So that means we have more vegetables and less fat. We should fat. have should more be, vegetables. Yeah. Should be better, isn't it? It's true. It's um, how about breastfeeding? Does it make a difference? Oh, definitely. Breastfeeding protects the breast against breast cancer. It's because of changes in the pathology. Um, we know that uh, from pathological studies that breast cancer uh, breast cells are unstable if you don't go through the whole maturation process, which means that the breast. Uh, function is for uh, lactation. Right. So for uh, pregnancy, there are changes in the breast cells, and then for lactation, there are also changes in the breast cells, which cause right. the cells to become more stable. Okay. And uh, it will protect it against uh, changes uh, or cancer changes. Right. I'm going to ask you a number of myths coming up, so we're going to okay, have some quick sure. answers, a quick question, yeah. quick question, quick answers. Mm. I mean, with due respect. Does uh, women have bigger breasts have a higher chance of getting breast cancer? Well, in fact, uh, uh, women with cup A or B sizes do have breast cancer. Right. We don't find a difference between cup A, B or cup C, D. Right. How about women with breast implants? Um, does it cause cancers? No, uh, breast implants are silicone implants. They themselves are medically inert. They don't cause cancer. Right, okay. And can you, as I said, food that can cause cancer, is there any supplements we can, we can take to for prevention? I think uh, city people always like to take food supplements, which is not the way we advocate. Right. It should be natural food, fresh things, and less preservatives. Right. And uh, animal fat is something which we need to cut down. So dairy okay. products go for low-fat preparation. Okay. And how about those on contraceptive pill or, on, or um, hormonal replacement therapy? Mm. Is it going to increase the chance of breast cancer? For oral contraceptive pills, there's still um, no definite evidence uh, that it will increase risk of breast cancer. But for hormone replacement therapy after menopause, uh, there are studies that show that there is an increased risk of breast cancer, especially for those who take uh, a combined estrogen and progesterone pills. Oh, I see. Mm. Also, I've heard that hair dyes Mm. Can the cause of cancer? I mean, uh, is that true? I mean, one study said that if you have long term permanent hair dye or even those chemical hair straighteners, if they use it every five to six weeks, they increase 30% chance of having breast cancer. Is well, that true? I think for hair dyes, the, the content is really heavy metal, which we want to avoid. Right. Uh, but it, there's no definite proof that it will cause breast cancer. Yes. And how about stress? I mean, you, we, we have mentioned it earlier. Yeah, stress is uh, something which is like inherent with CCD people. And uh, we have studies that show that uh, if, you, uh, if you put yourself uh, or uh, the, uh, uh, think yourself has, stress, uh, has uh, stress right. uh, within uh, half of the time that you're living, uh, this will increase your odds ratio of breast cancer by 3.4, right. okay. which means 240% increase in breast right. cancer. So is breast cancer hereditary? Uh, there are uh, some who are hereditary, about 5% of okay. people uh, with breast cancer. You know, one, one I mean, my favorite actress, Angeline yeah. Jolie, I mean, he, Angeline sure. Jolie, he had her double mastectomy, meaning right. remove of both breasts because she has the BRCA gene. That's correct. I'm actually one of my medical friend oncologists in mm. Singapore, mm. Um, also a female, had both her breasts removed. Is that the thing that you advocate? Breast uh, cancer or BRCA gene mutation has an 80% lifetime chance of breast cancer. 80%. So people who have mutation carrier should be considering either a bilateral mastectomy or prevention by medications or close surveillance. So right. all these three are options for the patient. For right. Angelina Jolie, it's her choice. Right. Um, also in younger women, you mentioned um, even cup A and cup B and stress people. So all our youngsters are very, I mean, very, very smart now. They're all professionals. Is the incidence uh, increasing in the younger generation? Well, uh, it's not. In fact, uh, I think the younger generation, if they go for healthy living and healthy diet, uh, we hope the incidence will drop in future. Right. Uh, at the present time, about 8% of people are below the age of 40. Right. For those young patients, then we look out for hereditary gene mutation uh, right. carrier. Yeah, in the second part of the first part, I'm going to ask you about how do you detect since this is such an um, increasing uh, cancer in, in women. Mm. Um, what do you look for? I mean, we know that, um, do you check yourselves every day? Is it adequate? Well, checking yourself every day, uh, it's something which is good, a good practice to be aware of your own breast uh, changes, uh, but it can only detect um, palpable cancer. We want to catch a breast cancer early enough uh, before it can be uh, felt oh. by yourself. Right, so are all the lumps can cancerous? No. In fact, for young people, um, lumpy breast is uh, quite a common problem, especially those with associated with pain. Mm -hmm. This is called benign breast change or okay. fibrocystic change. They're very and, common. Yeah, and also, we mentioned earlier, men do get breast cancers True. as well. Yes. How do we check? Well, uh, for men, because there's no 
breast development. It's only right. a breast, but underneath the nipple. So if you find anything which is hard underneath the nipple, then you should see a doctor. Right. And I've heard the government had launched a breast cancer screening pilot scheme in September. Yeah. Can you tell us briefly, I mean, does it apply to all the women and it, does it cost them anything? Well, uh, for the um, policy in breast screening, um, the, the Department of Health has issued guidelines uh, which divides people into increased risk or average risk. Right. For, so obviously we know that for uh, increased risk people who have uh, families job who carry mutation carrier, mm -hmm. they should have a yearly uh, mammogram screening. Mm -hmm. But for the average risk women without uh, family history of breast cancer, they are still um, uh, at risk for breast cancer. Right. So for people who are in the age of 44 to 69, uh, which is recommended by the Department of Health, uh, those with high risk factors like um, obesity, uh, lack of exercise, uh, first childbirth being uh, more than the age of 30, uh, having history of benign breast disease, they should also uh, consider undergoing a every two year mammogram. Mm. Uh, so uh, they are subsidized if they belong to a higher score right. uh, under uh, this uh, risk factor profile. I'm, I'm going to ask one last question before the break. Mm. Um, since you're doing self-checking, why do you still need to do mammograms? Well, mammogram can detect things which are not palpable. Uh, How regular should they go for mammogram? They should go for a two-yearly mammogram from right. the age of 44, recommended right. by the Department of Health. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. We'll, we'll go for a break and don't go away. Welcome back. We have been talking with Dr. Polly Zhang about breast cancer. She has been debunking some of the common myths for us and advising our viewers on how it can be detected earlier. So Polly, on the first part we were talking about some myths of uh, breast cancer. You mentioned the importance of uh, self-checking and also mammogram every two years. Some question about mammograms that our viewers asked me to okay. ask you. They said that they complained that doing the, the mammogram can be quite uncomfortable or something mm. you use the word painful. Mm. What would be your message to them? Well, I think you should go for uh, experience uh, centers or dedicated breast screening centers because occasional radiographers, if they're not familiar or they, if they're not used really? to doing it, then you will feel more pain. Basically, the breast is compressed between two plates until it's tight, that they are mm -hmm. not moving, then you can take a picture. Right. And in fact, the advance of 3D mammogram uh, helps in that aspect as well, because mm -hmm. they don't need to compress all the way down. Mm -hmm. Some claims, one of the myths is the radiation from the mammogram can cause cancer, or even by depressing the breast when we're doing the, the, the mammogram, as you said, can actually cause the cancer to spread. Are these two myths true or not? Uh, definitely not. A mammogram is like taking three chest X-rays in a row. So the um, irradiation exposure to a mammogram is 0.3 millisievert, and our our body annual uh, tolerance for any um, for any uh, irradiation exposure is uh, more than three millisievert. So it's like one tenth or one eighth of the total annual exposure. E exposure means that you are watching TV, you are flying in the air, and all this will give you radiation exposure as well. So it's quite minimal. That's true. But, but actually pressing it, that will cause the cancer to spread? No, in fact not. Uh, because even if uh, there's somebody who has a higher uh, chance of a lump being breast cancer, we do more invasive procedures like putting a true cut needle inside. So this uh, will not give you a spread of breast cancer. Right, I, I, I understand there's something called the needle aspiration. Yes, correct. Yes, that yeah. will be part of the biopsy procedures That's you can right, do yeah. as well. It will not cause the spread of cancer. Right, okay. So we have talked about what is breast cancer. We talked about how to detect it. Let's talk about how to treat it. Mm. See, I'm sure any, any, any woman or man, when they are told they're having cancer, especially breast cancer, to them it's like the end of the world. Mm. Is that true? Yes, uh, to many of them it's uncertainty that they're facing. But right. in fact, if you detect a breast cancer early, uh, the chance of cure is very high. The average uh, survival is 85% in 10 years. So if you detect the cancer at stage one, it's more than 90%. So it's, it's quite, a, okay, in a way, quite a curable, treatable, disease, yes. treatable and curable disease. Yes, yes. Correct, yeah. And you know, um, as you said, some of the, another reason why ladies are afraid of a diagnosis is it's quite obvious they might be worried that they may lose their, their breasts, which is a very yes. important part of the body. Um, true. Is that still the case? Um, the surgical advances 
help it better to to preserve whatever we have and, and, yes. and still have a good prognosis? That's why early detection is important. If you can um, detect the cancer in a, a non-palpable stage or they are small, then you only need to remove the lump. Right. And you don't need to remove the whole breast. And the lumpectomy coupled with radiation already have the same survival as a mastectomy. So nowadays uh, it's not a taboo anymore right. with breast cancer. Right. You know, um, as you know, all options, all treatment options for cancer uh, invariably increase, um, includes surgery, um, chemotherapy, and um, um, radiation. radiation yeah. Any advances recently? For breast cancers. Right. Uh, this is called a uh, multimodality treatment or we call it multidisciplinary treatment. With a combination of all these tools we can uh, save the women's lives mm -hmm. uh, by ex uh, increasing the survival. Uh, radiation, as I mentioned, if you're doing a lumpectomy, is an uh, integral part of the cancer treatment. But advances a lot more in uh, medical treatment. Nowadays we identify the tumor biology and we, can, we, will, um, we will undergo medical treatment according to the tumor biology. In tumor biology, it means that there are three types of cancer. One, a hormone-sensitive cancer, which is two-thirds of the patients. The other one third, is either a triple negative cancer or her two positive cancer. And now the advances is that we can give, if the patient is required to have chemotherapy, give it upfront before right. the surgery. That will help to shrink down the tumor so that the woman can enjoy lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy oh. as well. So all these are recent advances. That's so to minimize the, the impact of surgery to the lady. And yeah. with, with um, um, chemotherapy, we all know that uh, people do feel unwell or they lose their hair. Um, does the same up, um, does the same type of is it the same type of chemotherapy drugs you use for breast cancers as other cancers? Do you still have the side effects? Uh, we do have side effects because chemotherapy kills cells, kill rapid growing cells. Right. So hair is something which is rapidly growing, so you may have hair loss. Uh, fortunately now we are developing some cool caps which will help right. to uh, reduce the temperature of the scalp so that yes. uh, hair loss may be a bit less. And uh, white blood cells is also something which is rapidly um, uh, being used and also destroyed and replaced by the uh, bone marrow. So you may run into a white uh, blood count, uh, low uh, counts. Mm -hmm. and, but there are a lot of medications, supportive drugs, which will help the patient to go through chemotherapy. Right, you mentioned cool caps. I mean, I've heard that before. Is it you're putting some icy caps over, over your hair? I mean, how does over that work? Over the head. It's, it's like, a, um, like, like a cushion that you put on the, on the head uh, as a cap. Uh, it's a pre-cooled cap, so you have to cool the scalp before you start the chemotherapy, oh. and then afterwards, then you slowly uh, warm up. Yeah. Right. So it's something which is uh, quite uh, promising, but uh, we still need to have a lot more research into it. Right. And how about traditional Chinese medicine? I mean, we often hear about people taking Wan Qi or Ling Qi and all those stuff. <laughs> what is your opinion? Seem to be treating those, that for so long. I consider those as health food if you want to uh, label it. Um, there's no definite uh, level one medical evidence that they are active against uh, breast uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I can tell you that the uh, one uh, drug which we often use in breast cancer, which is called taxane, is derived from the bark of a, uh, a tree. Oh. So this, uh, from the medical literature in Chinese medicine, has been used before in Chinese medicine. But um, this um, medications or this chemical compound has been extracted from the tree bark and become a medically usable chemotherapy agent, which right. is very effective against breast cancer. Mm, okay, so we had a brief overview of the treatment. Let's look at some challenges and future advances. Um, you founded the Hong Kong Breast Cancer Foundation mm. in 2005. What is the purpose of the foundation? Well, it's something uh, uh, that medical doctors is inadequate in handling, like patients' emotional uh, stress uh, during the treatment, and also uh, paramedical supports. A lot of patients who have undergone axillary dissection with lymphedema or arm swelling afterwards. So right. these are things which uh, we, we are unable to handle all these things. And so a holistic cancer care is not just the medical treatment that right. we give. It's the emotional support and also the paramedical supports. And so Hong Kong Breast Cancer Foundation, um, it's uh, run by survivors together with the help of um, um, healthcare professionals to fulfill this gap. Uh, which is lacking uh, between. Right. So uh, it's yeah. more than just a support group to the patients? Not just uh, peer support, but which is very important yes. still. Yes. Um, we mentioned about the actress Angel Angelina Jolie, and and it seems that I mean, I'm sure she has to go through reconstruction. Yes. Um, how successful is reconstruction? And in your experience, when you when you talk to the, your patient, the one who are well, 
I mean, how much oh, can they get back to normal life? I mean, I mean, because it's completely new. Mm. What are their general feedback? Well, uh, they have to be counselled very carefully before uh, the um, the surgery. Right. Uh, immediate reconstruction uh, uh, offers the best aesthetic results and immediate. Also Yes, and also the best psychological outcome right. because you don't have a period of loss of breath. Right. And the sensation can be better than a, a, a delayed reconstruction. So uh, reconstruction helps a lot of women going through mastectomy uh, with, the, uh, with the hope of uh, going back to normal. Yeah. Right. Is the cosmetic result satisfactory in your eyes? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if, we can, if the tumor can be detected early and we can do a nipple sparing mastectomy, uh, which means that we uh, save the whole skin envelope together with the nipple right. and just replace something in the inside with the fat from the tummy or, or some of the implants. Then uh, the result is so good that even on follow-up, I, I have to look at the nooks before I can tell whether the patient has a real breast or a, a constructed breast. Right, that's quite very re reassuring yes. and encouraging. Even taking uh, fat tissue from the tummy, mm, yes. that means they reduce their tummy as well at the same yes, time. Yes. Um, what is, I mean, you've been treating breast cancers for the last 20, 30 years. Mm. In your opinion, what is the best way to reduce the incidence and the impact of breast cancer in Hong Kong? I think primary prevention uh, from young age uh, uh, or teenagers, they should start uh, to have healthy living uh, with a healthy diet and also uh, lifestyle changes with more exercise. Uh, these are important. Uh, stress is something that uh, we have to learn how to cope with stress, uh, even in the city life. This is primary prevention. Secondary prevention is to early detection. We have to go for the gold standard of screening, which is mammogram still now. But for dense breast, uh, we may add on ultrasound just to supplement the inadequacy of mammogram mm -hmm. in dense breast. Mm -hmm. So secondary prevention is very important. And hopefully in the future, we can have other ways to detect any DNA damage in the cells and we can do DNA repair. So this will, leading, this will be leading to medical advancement in um, uh, the development of more medicine for mm -hmm. the treatment of breast cancer. When you talk about future, I mean, as you just said, I mean, DNA therapy or DNA mm. detection is very, mm. it looks like a very promising way to go forward. Mm. Um, how likely or how cost effective is it going to be? I mean, you have 40 new cases a, a, a day diagnosed. Do you do DNA testing on every patient or just no. find the, the one at risk? That's not what I mean. It's uh, really um, if it's really for a small minority of people who may have DNA mutation like the carriers. So uh, those, uh, we have guidelines for who to uh, look oh, for uh, genetic counseling before they do the genetic testing. So um, in the market, there are too many genetic tests which are freely, you can just get your saliva and have it done. Right. I think it's quite uh, dangerous because there's no uh, counseling on what to see. And I do have patients who have undergone such tests and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, they have to be well informed or counseled before they do any gene testing. Last question for you. When are we going to find a cure for cancer, for breast cancer? I think like TB, previously tuberculosis is a very common uh, disease and we, we don't know how to treat them. And then we have drugs uh, to mm -hmm. tackle them. And so now it's been trickling down to a minority of patients right. only. So I do have hope that in future, with the molecular development in understanding of cancer biology, we'll have a day that we will mitigate it. Right. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for coming to share with us all the perspectives of breast cancer. I hope that our viewers will take note of all the recommendations Dr. Zhang have given us. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good week and good night.